uh, today I'll give a little bit of an overview of uh, the pathophysiological mechanisms uh, linked to sarcopenia. So as already introduced previously, sarcopenia is characterized by the loss of muscle mass and muscle function. So I'll try to not speak too fast since uh, I'm the only one speaking English. So the skeletal muscle mass, uh, as you can see here on the slides, uh, in, is a balance of protein degradation and protein synthesis. So in the case, let's say in a positive situation, let's say after exercise, when protein synthesis increases more than protein degradation, we are in a situation where muscle starts to grow and we are uh, going into muscle hypertrophy. Well, in many disease conditions, uh, what we have is actually an increase in protein degradation, which, uh, let's say, is more pronounced than the uh, protein synthesis, and this leads to muscle wasting and muscle atrophy. Oh, okay. So why is it interesting to stu study uh, muscle mass? So clearly because uh, to move and to do things with our body, we need to use our muscles. So 40% of our body weight is skeletal muscle. <coughs> and besides though uh, producing movement, um, skeletal muscles are also very important for many uh, whole body metabolic functions. Uh, heat production is one, but there are, are multiple others. And in the last years, I would say 10 to 15 years, particularly from, uh, from Denmark, there was a lot of studies going on which they, in which they identified muscle also as being an endocrine organ. So it releases signals which communi communicate with other organs, for example, with fat, or lately also the brain is being mentioned. So muscle in the, whole, in the body, let's say, regulates many different functions. So as I said, uh, many different, let's say, pathological conditions have, uh, have in common that they have an increase in muscle loss. So they have muscle wasting. So here we see a list, so ranging from genetic diseases to previously mentioned cancer, cachexia, or uh, chronic heart failure, diabetes. They all have in common that there is an important component of muscle wasting. And this reduces not just the quality of life, but in a lot of pathologies, it might not be the main let's say, a reason of the pathology. But for example, cancer is a good example where the muscle wasting, if it's rescued without, for example, affecting tumor growth, it could actually increase lifespan. So uh, muscle is a, a quite important tissue also during many uh, pathological conditions. And here we see aging sarcopenia. So just regular aging is also one of the uh, key factors which leads to uh, muscle wasting. And in many cases, these pathological conditions need to be summed to sarcopenia. So we are now, I think, this is one of the very open issues in, uh, in muscle physiology, muscle research, is how sarcopenia and a lot of these pathologies interact, leading to a poor muscle quality. So here we see <coughs> sarcopenia is a, let's say, a, a gradual, oh, sorry, a gradual loss in, uh, in muscle mass and also in muscle function. It starts relatively early, 45 years old. You can already see some mass is being lost. I'm still pretty safe, I'm, but I'm, I'm getting closer. Uh, when you're 70, you have a very significant muscle wasting. And in this graph, you can nicely see a summary, a summary of uh, how muscle mass and muscle strength are actually changing over time. So with, with age in the, in the beginning, uh, when you are growing up, uh, they are clearly increasing both mass and function. During adult life, this remains relatively constant, we, even though we have a relatively big range of, de uh, let's say, decline of muscle mass. And this range uh, is strongly influenced also by exercise, as you can see here. So uh, particularly when we get to the aged population, some people still, they do lose muscle mass. This is inevitable, but you can actually, let's say, slow down the loss of muscle mass and muscle function quite a lot by performing regular exercise. So here we see this uh, same slide more or less saying the same thing. So to avoid this situation where we have muscle weakness and uh, disability, where it's very good to uh, be very active, so per perform a regular exercise. And I'll show some data on this uh, later on. 
And in these sarcopenic muscles, so in these muscles which are losing force and losing muscle mass, we have a lot of pathological situations going on. So we have a lot of, uh, so we can see here, there is denervation, so some muscle fibers, they are no longer innervated. Uh, we have a general inflammation, which is uh, leading to uh, muscle wasting. We have oxidative stress. What all these three things uh, have in common as well, and let's say another hallmark, a major sign of, uh, of, of muscle aging is mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, in skeletal muscle during aging, mitochondria start to function worse. And this is actually what I will focus on a small part of this talk. So what is regulating this, uh, this skeletal muscle wasting? So we're going a little bit into the mechanisms, going away from the regulations and the laws, which uh, being Dutch is very complicated already for an Italian, but for a Dutch person is even more complicated. So this is a bit more uh, <laughs> easy to understand, at least for me. Um, in order to understand which are the signals inside the muscle fiber which are actually regulating, so inducing this decrease in muscle performance. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was an, uh, a very important study done uh, by a group in Harvard, which actually compared muscles from different pathological conditions and examined which were the, micro the, the genes which were differentially regulated in the different conditions. So they examined in, let's say, cancer or disuse or, or heart failure, which are the genes which are going up or going down in these conditions. And then they looked to see if there were genes which were going up or down in all conditions. And these are the so-called atrogenes. So these are the genes which are, let's say, um, uh, a fingerprint of a muscle going into atrophy. So. Uh, these genes are generated, are um, an important part of these genes are regulated by this uh, transcription factor, which is FOXO. A lot of study, a lot of work on this has been done here by Professor Sandri in, uh, in Padova. And these genes, they code for many different uh, proteins which have different functions in the cell, so they can really regulate uh, translational regulation, so let's say parts of the ribosome. They can induce an unfolded protein response, which is a stress response in the cell. They are linked to protein degradation, so the breakdown of proteins, which is, I think, quite obvious, through the two different systems in the cell. So we have an autophagy lysosome system, which kind of eats the cell, and then we have the ubiquitin proteasome system, which more or less uh, titrates the proteins and degradates them in this way. And last but not least, uh, amongst these atrogenes, we found uh, m there were multiple genes linked to both glycolytic and oxidative metabolism suggesting that energy balance clearly is a major role in regulating muscle wasting. So when we go back to this scheme, which we saw before, what we can also add is that they have in common these different pathologies, not just muscle wasting, but also an alteration in mitochondrial function. So all these conditions are characterized by also dysfunctional mitochondria. So. Just to get an idea, what is an important uh, issue in regulating mitochondrial function is mitochondrial dynamics. I don't know, uh, everybody knows this image from the books. So a mitochondria being, as it's uh, depicted here, quite static. This is actually not how it is within a skeletal muscle. It's within a network. And this is a very dynamic uh, regulation. So my, uh, mitochondria are being fusing, so they fuse together. They, they are separated. They are, they are degraded, they are generated. So this is a very active process. And um, also here in Padova by the group of Luca Scorana, Scorano, uh, the important proteins in regulating these mitochondrial dynamics, so leading to, um, uh, let's say, mitochondrial fusion uh, or mitochondrial fission, so fun, uh, fusing two mitochondria to make a bigger one, which actually leads to an increase uh, in energy production, so in ATP production, so this is actually a positive situation, or uh, to, let's say, induce mitochondrial fission, so to segregate to, uh, two mitochondrial into, into one mitochondria into two. This is, for example, when a part of the mitochondrial network is not functioning properly, this needs to be taken away and degraded. So this part where, where you have, let's say, a turnover of the organelles inside the cell, this needs to be done through mitochondrial fission. So, <coughs> going back to sarcopenia, which is the key part of this, uh, of this talk, 
it is clear that this loss of muscle wasting is due to an important part due to disuse, no? so uh, inducing uh, activity, ac exercise, using your muscles, you can actually decrease this loss of muscle waste, uh, weight. However, there is also another part which is not just due to disuse, which is due to intrinsic pathological mechanisms inside the cell. Then doing some correlations with the expression levels of these, pro of these proteins with muscle mass, so muscle, here we see myofiber diameter, so how big is the fiber. We see that actually OPA1, if it increases, also myofiber size tends to increase. And the same is true for uh, muscle force. So OPA1 is actually the best correlation with uh, an increase in muscle force and in muscle mass. So this is all correlation, okay? So what we now want to understand is how fundamentally important are these mitochondrial networks during aging? So, is there a causal role between mitochondrial dynamics and muscle aging and sarcopenia? So, in order to understand this, to address this, what we did is we, re we just simply said, okay, let's take away OPA1 and see what happens to our muscles. So, now we go to the mice uh, <coughs> because, uh, well, uh, you need to do some transgenic approaches which are a bit more difficult in humans. And so what we use, I will just go a bit through, quickly through the details, what we can actually do is use these mice to generate mice which lack this protein, OPA1, only in skeletal muscles of adult animals. So we wait till the mice become adults, we treat these mice with a, with a drug, and this actually leads to the deletion of this gene only in skeletal muscle, but not in other tissues. So all the brain, the, the, the liver, everything else is, is fine. So this way we can really address what is the role of OPA1 only in skeletal muscle. So what did we see? So when we look at the muscles after we delete OPA1 from adult skeletal muscles, we actually see that there is a progressive muscle atrophy. So here you can see this is a normal tibialis anterior of the mouse. And when we take out OPA1 after 50 days, about two months, the muscle is already a little bit smaller. And after four months, the muscle is almost completely absent. <coughs> We can also see this when we look at the animals. So here the animals are much smaller and they also develop these uh, typical signs of muscle weakness, which is the kyphosis, uh, which uh, occurs in many uh, mouse models of muscle weakness. Also mus measuring muscle force, we find that the muscles uh, in these animals are significantly weaker than, that one, uh, than the ones <coughs> from control animals. So. <coughs> This suggests that OPA1 has an important role in skeletal muscles, but what about whole body aging? So interesting, interestingly, and I will spare you a, a lot of the details, uh, what we found is that when you take away OPA1 from only from skeletal muscles, these mice actually generate a whole body systemic aging. And uh, there are, we had different uh, markers which were actually uh, indications, let's say, of a whole body systemic aging problems in the liver, uh, the blood sugar levels, inflammation. Here we have the innervation, so myofibers are actually losing innervation, uh, which is, uh, is becoming more and more a, a key part, let's say, I think, of uh, sarcopenia. And interestingly, these mice are actually all uh, dead within four months after deletion. So yes, this is, it suggests to us that um, OPA1 in muscle can, if you delete it, leads to an accelerated aging with a premature uh, uh, lethality. Oh, okay. So then the last part, just to see, okay, so in which way then can deletion of OPA1 lead to muscle wasting? So clearly, mitochondrial dysfunction has many effects on the cell. So we, dis we examined many different aspects of uh, muscle physiology. Uh, but one of the main things uh, which stood out was the, the oxidative stress. So when we take away OPA1 and we have mitochondrial dysfunction, what we actually found was there's a lot more proteins which are carbonylated, which is a modification indicative of an increase in oxidative stress. And so we wondered, can oxidative stress be, let's say, the mediator leading to muscle wasting and su su successive, let's say, in increased aging? So in order to address this, we actually treated our mice, which I showed to you previously, with an antioxidant. So we treated the mice with uh, Trolox, as you can see here, which is a more or less a general antioxidant. And uh, we tried to see after two weeks of antioxidant treatment how these mice were actually doing. 
And what we found is that, of course, uh, the treatment worked properly. We see less oxidative stress, less, ER, less uh, UPR response. And uh, interesting, and this is the most important thing, we actually found that uh, mu muscle fiber atrophy, so the atrophy induced by the loss of OPA1, was completely prevented when we actually treated these mice with an antioxidant, which is Trolox. Suggesting the following, um, let's say, overall scheme, um, which is more or less my last slide. So this is our working model. So as you can see here, when from a skeletal muscle, we delete OPA1 and therefore, let's say, reduce mitochondrial health, we, uh, we reduce mitochondrial fusion, mitochondria, this mitochondrial dysfunction leads to an increase in oxidative stress in the cell, leading to this release of this myokine, uh, FGF21, which is a, a long story, which is the reason for all these systemic effects uh, on uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in skeletal muscle, leading to the regulation of the master transcription factor regulating muscle atrophy, which is FOXO, inducing muscle atrophy. So indeed, inhibiting the increase in re uh, reactive uh, ROS production, we are actually able to prevent muscle atrophy. So um, a lot of this work clearly was done also by uh, Marco Sandri. These are the people who did the work. And also Lucas Corana, who was uh, responsible for all the part on the mitochondrial fusion. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.